increase our faith. And I pray that you would use the situations that we have mentioned and some, as Randy says, unspoken that are deep upon our hearts that we do not utter publicly. I pray that you would hear the cries from within and I pray that you would show yourself we'd be thankful. Lord, I ask you that you'd use us as a ministry. And Lord, uh, people come and go, and one of the difficult decisions that I have to make for me is who is to be where. And Lord, I ask you that you would uh, give leadership there. I never, never thought whenever I shook Steve Benelov's hand and found out that he was in maintenance for a school program in New York. And I teasingly said, maybe the Lord bring you to Orlando. You come to work for us. That it would actually happen. But I'm so glad that it did. And I love these folks. Thank you for them. And you bless them. But Lord, we, we, we just ask you that you give leadership to the best of our ability. We're we just going to trust you and cast all our cares upon you. Help these that are sick, Lord. I pray that you would touch them. And to depart is far better. All of us would agree with that. But Lord, Paul said to remain here is more needful for you. And we become a little selfish sometimes. And we ask you that you'd keep people around. But I ask you that you would glorify your name. And I pray that you'd minister have your sweet will and way. Bless this day for your sake. May you be glorified. You're worthy, Father. You're worthy. Lord, I pray that you'd help me to keep that before my mind. And uh, I pray that you'd receive praise and power and honor and glory. And we'll be thankful. Bless every class, young and old alike, in Jesus' name. Amen, amen, and amen. Okay, take your Bibles. And uh, we're going to go over to Psalms 92 in the scriptures, Psalms 92, and uh, go back over to Psalms chapter 1 as well. So Psalms 92. Linwood, you going home? I mean, excuse me, are you leaving Orlando? Orlando's your home now. So when you go back north, you're just visitors up there. You know it's still snowing up in that area? And, uh, yeah, uh, I need you to do me a favor before you leave. Brother Linwood, uh, he has, he has, uh, been a real help to us around here. Uh, we've got men that work at keeping our facilities clean. And he's one of those guys, and he comes over every week, and he runs what, we, what is called a billy goat. Now, that billy goat is a vacuum cleaner. And uh, so it vacuums the parking lot and everything, around the sidewalks and the doorways. And I appreciate that. He doesn't want recognition for that. It's something he's doing for the Lord. But he's going to be leaving. So I need you to shake some hands. He texted me a few weeks ago, and he said, you know, that billy goat fits my hands pretty good. And so I need you to shake hands and see which hands that you shake might fit that billy goat so that you can say, I'm going to uh, give you a duty to do for the next six months, and I'll return. But uh, I appreciate you. Bible's open to Psalms 92. Um, I want to talk today, my lesson today is called the Palm Tree People. And so, well, we, Palm Sunday was two Sundays ago, Pastor. You're a little late. Well, not really. Because what I want to talk today is not so much about Palm Sunday. And I did talk about Palm Sunday two Sundays ago. But I want to talk about Palm Tree People. Now, as I shared with you uh, on Palm Sunday that these people... They broke off these palm branches. They took and strode their garments in the way, and they were praising the Lord. They were waving the palm branches as praise unto God. Now, if we're going to be palm tree people, 
we ought to be giving praise unto God. And I don't know of anything that we ought to praise God more about than his resurrection. And so I chose to do palm tree people after we celebrate the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. Look at Psalms 92 and look down at verse number 12. The Bible says, the righteous shall flourish like the palm tree. He shall grow like a cedar in Lebanon. Those that be planted in the house of the Lord shall flourish in the courts of our God. They shall still bring forth in old age. They shall be fat and flourishing to show that the Lord is upright. He is my rock and there is no unrighteousness in him. Now, when you think about palm trees, the, the Bible uses several illustrations and people when he talks about trees and tree people. Uh, you know, Adam and Eve, they ate off the tree. And Zacchaeus, he climbed up the tree. Uh, our Lord, he was hung upon a tree. False prophets are referred to as corrupt trees. And uh, Christians are likened unto good trees. Jonah, he, had, uh, he was given a special shade tree. And Moses cut down a tree, cast it into the bitter water, and the water became sweet. And so Elijah, he pouted under a juniper tree. Uh, Jesus cursed, cursed a fig tree. So trees are found in the Scriptures in many different ways and used by many different people. And to think that today I want to talk to you about a palm tree Christian or a palm tree people, that, uh, that that's who we are. We're found in the house of the Lord. We're found in the courtyards of our God. And we would be offering praise to Him. Back over in Psalms chapter 1, the psalmist said, Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night, and he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water. Now that tree that's planted by the rivers of water, notice he says in verse number three that that tree is going to bring forth fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. Now, our text there talks about this, this tree, this righteous, the righteous shall flourish like the palm tree. This righteousness. Uh, there's a couple of righteousnesses that are found in the Scriptures. Actually, if we go over to chapter 10 of Romans, we'll find four or five righteousnesses according to how you want to look at it. But there's a righteousness of man, there's a righteousness of God, there's a righteousness of Christ, there's a righteousness which comes by faith. And uh, so there's a way that seemeth right unto man, and the end thereof is the ways of death. Solomon says this twice, sometimes our righteousness, our ways is not the right way. They've not submitted themselves under the righteousness of God. God's got a righteousness that we cannot attain. But I'm glad that God has taken the Lord Jesus Christ and he's made him sin for us and that we've been made righteous in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now this righteousness that we are made, and uh, just a, a brief thing about two righteousnesses, but the righteousness that we are made as a righteousness that is received. It is something that is taken and given unto us. The Bible says in Romans chapter 5 and in verse number 19, for as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so by the obedience of one shall many be. Notice what it says. It says that we are made righteous. We are made righteous. That's a righteousness which we have received. There's a word that is used, a Greek word that is used in Romans chapter uh, 4, 5, 6, and it's, it's used multiple times, but in the English it's translated a different word, and that word is made. It has to do, it, it, another time it is listed and it's interpreted as imputed. Now, I'm going to go to the bank, or I went to the bank, 
uh, at least Miss Richie went to the bank this past week. We got paid this past Wednesday. And my pay is direct deposit. And so I'm able to go to my bank account and I'm looking at my bank account and I see that there's money that has been deposited in my bank account. It has been imputed. It is a, it is a clerical term. It is a bookkeeping term. It is credited to my account. The righteousness which we have in the Lord Jesus Christ is credited to my account. It is imputed. It's not something that I have done. It's not something that I have earned. It is something that Christ has done on my behalf. It is the righteousness of our Savior. And that's that righteousness which is a faith that Paul talks about in Romans chapter 10. Well, how do you receive that righteousness which is a faith? Well, Paul said the word is nigh thee. He said, it's in thy mouth and in thy heart. He says, it's the word which we believe. What is that word that we believe? What is the word that's so close to us that we understand it? That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. That imputed righteousness that comes from the Lord Jesus Christ. Sign language is not the same around the world. Here we learn and we speak an American sign language. And there are some words or some things that are descriptive in other parts of the world that I think is wonderful. And I use, uh, we had uh, Deaf Fantastic Saturday, Saturday here a few years ago. And we had a gentleman here from South Africa. He was a missionary to the deaf. And he was teaching us some sign language that was used in South Africa. Now, a salvation in American Sign Language is just simply this. We have been set free. So we're no longer under bondage. We are free. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. And I'm glad that he sets us free. Now, this preacher said in South Africa, salvation is not this. Salvation is this. And he said that the illustration is that someone is walking down a trail and is going to fall off the cliff, but God comes in and snatches them. And he catches them. He takes them away from destruction, from death. And I said, boy, I tell you what, I like that. Woo, that's good stuff. That's good preaching, you know, that here... God comes and snatches. That's a wonderful thing. And I believe it's a beautiful illustration of, uh, of salvation. Chinese. Now, in, China, in Chinese, they say that, that uh, when we talk about the Lord, we talk about the Lord. We talk about Jesus. And that's American Sign Language. But in Chinese Sign Language... Talking about Jesus, it is this. And do you know what that is? Three and one. Ooh, I kind of like that too, don't you? Don't you? And I, I'm, I've read, and I don't know what the sign language is for lamb, in Chinese, but in Chinese, that the sign language for sacrifice is the picture of I behind the lamb. Now, John says that the Lord Jesus Christ is the lamb that taketh away the sin of the world. And so I am found in him. But I am found in him in his righteousness. It's the righteousness of the lamb that I stand in. And so I'm thankful. I ought to praise God because of the righteousness that he has bestowed upon me. Now, a good name is rather to be chosen than silver and go choice silver. And I'm glad that uh, the wares have got a good name, uh, some of us. And, uh, and, uh, I, and I'm thankful that the, the name that my mom and dad passed on to us, a good name. Now, I, I don't want to bring shame to that name. 
Now, it, it, there is there's something about me that I want to I want to do what's right. Okay, I want to I want to do what's right, and I would not want to leave a bad name for my children. So there is something that compels me to continue this good name that had been passed down to me. When I think of righteousness and how that the Lord has made us righteous, he has imputed righteousness to us, and we have become his workmanship. We've been saved. It's not of ourselves. It's a gift of God, lest any man should boast. And he says that we are his, for we are his workmanship, created unto, what is it? Good works. Now, do you, when, when I think of righteousness, do you think of good works? Do you think of doing that which is right when you think of righteousness? So there's a righteousness that which we receive, but there is also a righteousness which is reflected. And if I may use that, I'm not talking about our Savior's righteousness, which is imputed unto us, but it's a righteousness which we have, a personal righteousness. Now, just as I want to maintain a good name because a good name has been passed down to me, I want to continue in righteousness because the righteousness has been imputed unto me. I want to represent what I am. And so he has made me righteous. I want to continue in that. And so there's righteousness which is reflected, individual or personal righteousness, uh, the righteousness of the saints. Now, we cannot have righteousness without Jesus Christ. And we, I'm not boasting on any righteousness whatsoever except for his. But I do believe that God has created us in Christ Jesus under good works. He has ordained that we should walk in them, according to Ephesians chapter 2 and verse number 10. And in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse number 21, Paul said to the church at Corinth, For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made that righteousness of God in him. So that righteousness... It, it, it is something that is active in our hearts and lives, and our works show forth that righteousness which he has done. Now, our personal righteousness is described in good works. So somebody turn over to Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5, and read for me verse number 16. Verse 16. You'll know it whenever you hear it. You'll be able to quote it. So who has Matthew 5, verse 16 for us? You'll read it for us. Somebody, anybody, everybody? All right. Ma'am? Your right did, did he not say that we're the light of the world? Did he, did he, did he not say that a candle is not taken and put under a bushel? Right there in that context, and he's talking about this. Now, Jesus says, if we're going to be the light of the world, if we're going to be taken and put upon a candlestick that will light the entire city, he said that we're to let our light so shine before men that they may see your good works. That's the righteousness which is being, uh, which is being performed by those that are righteous. Now, just as a palm tree flourishes, I believe the righteousness of men and women, if they walk in the Lord, I believe that it will flourish as well. For we know that all things work together for the good of them that love God, to them that are called according to his purpose. Now, that's a great verse for us to quote. But verse number 29 tells us the reason that God is doing that. For he has predestined us to be conformed to the image of his dear son. He wants us to be more like Jesus. Now, I'm, this is not boastful, but it's factual. I think I'm probably a little bit more, a little bit, a little bit more like Jesus today than I was when I got saved. I believe I've grown a little bit, maybe not much, 
but I've grown a little bit spiritually since I've gotten saved. And I've allowed, or God has used the things that have taken place in my life to cause me to be a little bit, a little bit more like Jesus today than I was when I got saved. He is working in our hearts and in our lives. The person who is not not flourishing spiritually is a person that is not adding to his faith. And is that not what Peter said? Peter said we are to add to our faith. What's the first thing that he says that we are to add to our faith? Does anybody know? Nobody knows? Lars, what is it? Virtue. 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 Now, all of the things that he says that we're to add is something that is going to be manifested. But that virtue has something to do with, uh, with uh, who we are. The acts or the works that we do. My friend, uh, some say uh, we, we've got, we, we've, got uh, we've got a neighbor that loves cats and uh, I mean they, they love cats and we my wife is not a cat lover okay and we went outside yesterday and she said you see that hair on that mat that cat sleeping up here on our on our back porch okay and she's not a cat person my dogs are not cat dogs. So if I were to say something to my wife, she'd say I'm not a cat person. Uh, uh, you know, <clears throat> I don't know what to say. Sometimes I don't think I'm a people person. I got a kind of hermit streak in me, you know, where I'll be by myself or something or other. But as a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, we should not, we cannot say, I'm not a palm tree person. Because of what he is doing in our hearts and in our lives, what he has done in our being, and because of his active work around us, we have to offer praise unto him. The righteous, we're going to not only flourish, but the psalmist says that we're going to like a palm tree. And so there is some growth that is taking place. When you think of a palm tree, there's a couple of things that we need to think about in a palm tree. And I thought about the surroundings of the palm tree. He says there in verse number uh, 12 of Psalms 92, he said, the righteous shall, uh, not, not verse number, not verse number 12. He says, verse number one, the righteous shall flourish like the palm tree, shall grow like a cedar, uh, a cedar in Lebanon. Those that be planted in the house of the Lord shall flourish in the courts of our God. He says in Psalms chapter number one, he says that we're going to be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit and his season. There's surroundings that takes place around us. Now, I don't know exactly where you are. And these trees are used uh, for various things. Uh, these cedar trees, something that was used in the building of the tabernacle and uh, Solomon used in his, uh, in his temple. Uh, these trees, any time that there's trees that are cut, uh, Pastor Bob and I, we've got a brother, and he's got a sawmill, and he, he enjoys working that sawmill. I enjoy up there, being up there working it as well. And take those big, massive pieces of trees that are three foot in diameter and putting them up on that that rail and run that sawmill down through there. Now, one thing that we keep going back and looking is making sure that it's straight. We want to make sure that it's straight. Everything is level because we're going to get our best lumber out of that. Wouldn't you like to build a house with crooked lumber? Uh, it, wouldn't, it wouldn't stand very well. 
And so we want good lumber. We want the lumber that is straight. And when I think about the surroundings of a palm tree, not cedars, but the palm trees, and I think about where they are, and I think about how that they are straight, but I also think about that that surroundings where they are is uh, not hard red mud like you find in South Carolina. The palm trees are found in sand. The settings, that palm tree is upright. God asked a question in Job chapter 2. In verse number 3, Hast thou considered my servant Job, that there is none like him in the earth, a perfect and an upright? This guy's straight. This guy's straight. Upright. The heathen are not that way. I said earlier that the heathen, the unsaved, the wicked, are referred to as corrupt trees. The Bible says in Deuteronomy chapter 32, they have corrupted themselves. Their spot is like the spot of the children. They are a perverse and crooked generation. The Bible says in Philippians chapter 2 that we may be blameless and harmless as sons of God without rebuke in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation among whom ye shine as lights in the world. There should no such thing be as a crooked Christian. We're to be upright. Now you think with me for a second. I've been told, well, Pastor Steve, you just don't understand. This is business. And I'm just one of those that believes that your business ought to be upright as well. You're going to claim the name of Christ. There ought to be something that is going on. Not only is it upright, but secondly, it is upward. The branches don't grow out to the side as other trees. Those palm trees grow upward. They're reaching out. They're growing toward the top. Paul said to the church at Colossae, he said, If ye then been risen, risen with Christ, seek those things which are above. We're to set our affection on things above and not on the things of this earth. Those palm tree people have branches that are reaching outward, reaching upward, doing that which God would have us to do. Now, I chose a picture there, and I probably shouldn't have done this with uh, the PowerPoint presentation because that's kind of hard to read, isn't it? But I put those palm trees up there, and I put the camel in there. And you know why I put the camel in there? To make you think of the desert. And, and so, going over there and riding the camels around those palm trees and everything. Nice, hard soil that has been, you know, red dirt that's been packed. No, sandy soil. And those camels have those big old hoofs, those gigantic feet. Why? So that they don't mar down into that sand. And so when I think of this palm tree, I think of this palm tree that is out growing in the desert. They're, called, they're growing together, and it's referred to as a collection. If you're out in the desert, and you look across the, the desert, and it's so dry, and, every, and you see a bunch of a collection of palm trees, what do you think? Oasis, exactly, Tom. If I can get there. I'll be refreshed. And I think that that's what we ought to be. As we gather together, that we ought to be a collection. And that there are people that have come into this church ministry 
And they have been fighting the sun. They've been fighting the heat. They are parched and they're looking for some refreshing. We certainly ought to be that for them and to them. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. We ought to be a part of that. One palm tree by itself is, has a hard time in the heat. But these palm trees in this collection, in this oasis, they help one another. You know, the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 10 and verse number 25, I mean, especially us preachers, us Baptist preachers, we really are quick to pull that one out because we want to see the auditorium filled every time that we have a service. And it says that we're not to forsake the assembly of ourselves together. And that is true. But as I've encouraged you, we need to look back and see what the assembling of ourselves together is for. I believe it is for worship. I believe that it is uh, for uh, indoctrination. I believe it's for teaching. I believe that we're to be reading the Word of God. I think we're to be praising God. But he says, provoke ye one another unto love. He says that we are like a collection. And we are to be working in other people's lives to help them. I heard a little bit from my friend there in Maine because I have knowledge of some of the things that he's going through. And I wish that I could pull my little purple magic wand out of my desk and wave it and everything be fine. I do that in counseling sometimes. But I found that that magic wand doesn't help. And we have to just trust God. But you know, it's a wonderful thing to have somebody close by that'll talk with you, that'll listen to you, and that will encourage you. We're a collection. We're in the desert. We're an oasis. It's a place where you can find shelter. It's a place where you can find shade. He says, as ye have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him, rooted and built up in him, and established in the faith, as ye have been taught, abounding therein with thanksgiving. That's Colossians chapter 2, verse number 6 and 7. Let's see here. Get my brain working a little bit. Tonight, maybe, tonight, I'll make reference of a verse that's found in John chapter 16. Jesus said that it was expedient for him to go away. He said, if he goes not away, the comforter will not come. But if I go, he said, I'll send unto you another comforter. Now, I'm thankful for that. Boy, the Holy Spirit of God is such a wonderful, wonderful being to dwell within me and to be my comfort, to be my help, to be my guide. What a wonderful, wonderful thing it is. Boy, it's a great asset for us as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. But I am still reminded of the story of the little girl that was afraid. And Mommy said at night, sweetheart, Jesus is here with you. And she said, yeah, but Mommy, I want somebody with skin on. And I believe that we need somebody with skin on. I'm just talking about the collection, how that we are gathered together and how that we are rooted together and how that we are continuing Christ as Christ has left us an example that we are taking and as we have received him, that we are walking in him, that we are ministering unto others, the setting of the palm tree, the soil of the palm tree. In Psalms chapter 1 and verse number 3, he says, He shall be like a tree planted by the water, rivers of water, it bringeth forth his fruit in his season. Palm trees are able to flourish where other trees cannot. They're out there in that sandy soil. They're out there in the dryness. They're out there where 
the winds are harsh, the sun is hot, can I tell you that Christians ought to be able to withstand some of the changes in their environment, in their cultures, in their situations, in their scenarios better than the unsaved. It's, it's, a, hard, it's a hard thing. I, I, I pray that God don't allow me. I don't want to say I will never do this. But I pray that I never get so discouraged that I quit. Some have. Sometimes we, ho, 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 ho. Sometimes we need to put our name down just to be an encouragement. To just let somebody know that I'm there. There are times when you, me, everybody else, I guess, feels like I'm all alone. Nobody understands. I preached for Don Strange one year, and I made this statement that sometimes we're standing in the midst of the crowd, but yet we are lonely. After the service, one of the men came to me and said, Brother Steve said, there's a young lady back here in the back would like to talk to you. And I, I went back there and sat down with her and talked with her. She said, I'm a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, and her father was an evangelist. And she said, but I've run away from home. And she said, you know, I was just so tired, and, and I was wanting to live my life. And she said, when you said, when you're standing in the midst of a crowd and you feel like you're alone, I said, that's me. And she said, I don't believe anybody understands. Now, don't know what the situation, don't know what the scenario is from that day forward, except that she wanted to rededicate her life to the Lord. And I'm thankful for that. I'm just saying that a lot of times the sun gets really hot. And the air, it just kind of, it parches our lips. difficulties really come in. But God has taken and God has given something to the believer like a palm tree that flourishes in the desert where no one else can. John 15, 5 says, Jesus says, I am the vine, you are the branches. He that abideth in me and I in him the same bringeth forth much fruit. And without me, Ye can do nothing. He is truly our life source. Uh, sandy soil is required for the palm trees. My wife loves dogwoods. And this year we had our family gathering here in Orlando, which we thoroughly enjoyed and so glad that we did. But she said, after everybody was gone, I kind of miss going to South Carolina. And I said, you tell me you're missing that eight-hour drive, man. She said, no, I miss the dogwoods. And I always enjoy going up there in April and seeing the dogwoods blooming. And she said to me a few years ago, she said, I want to get a dogwood. I want to take it down to, and we'll plant it in the yard. And we stopped by uh, a florist there. And uh, went in, and she said, I want to buy a dogwood. And he said, ma'am, it won't grow down there. He said, you got sandy soil. They won't grow down there. It's too hot. They won't grow down there. But palm trees will. Palm tree people. 
We're glorifying the Lord. We're exalting Him. We're giving praise unto His name for what He has done, for who He is. And let me just say quickly that uh, there is strength that is found in palm trees. I mean, we can look and we see it. We see it all the time. Hurricanes come and they, and they crash against our coast and they blow buildings off the foundations and they just do devastating work and here's palm trees out there. Oh, they lose a few limbs, but they're still standing. And those old palm trees are standing. There's strength that is found in a palm tree. We're designed. We're designed. We're believers. Listen, Jesus said that in this world you're going to have trouble. There's going to be problems that you're going to face. But that's okay. I've overcome the world. He said, I've designed you to stand in a time of adversity. James. You might want to turn over to James and go to Revelation. You can find it a little bit quicker maybe if you go to the book of Revelation and, and back up a few pages. Find Hebrews right there and turn the page and look at James and uh, look at what uh, I'm trying Look at what James has to say to the believers. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the 12 tribes which are scattered abroad, greetings. Now, he's talking these men who are believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. In verse number 2, what does he say? He says, count it all joy when you fall into divers temptations. It's going to happen. Knowing this, that the trying of your faith, it worketh Patience. I'm glad that God's at work in our hearts and in our lives. But look at verse number four. In verse number four, he says, But let patience have her perfect work, that ye may be perfect and entire and wanting nothing. He said that these temptations, these trials, these tests that we go through sometimes, that there is the palm tree is going to continue to stand. There's going to be a perfect work that God is doing in our hearts and in our lives. This has to do with the durability of the palm tree. And they're able to withstand the storms, the fiber of the tree. Have you ever cut down a palm tree? I'm going to tell you what. I, it's not a problem. Just take an old chainsaw and just zip them right down. Get you a saw and go out there and... Zip them right down. But uh, I'm going to tell you, it's not that easy. Because a palm tree has all these little fibers inside of it. And those fibers are there. You know what those fibers do? They allow that tree to go. Mm, it allows them to bend without breaking. The wind gets rough on the palm trees and causes them to bow down toward the old earth. But I'm going to tell you, when the wind stops blowing, what do those palm trees do? They reach back upward. They're, they're standing straight as if our hands are raised to the Lord. Not only their durability, but uh, their depth. It's not easy to uproot a palm tree. I got to get over here. Preacher, the palm trees that were out here, we had to take them up. We had disease in them. I didn't know what to do with them. And I said, let's just redo everything out here. We'll take the palm trees up. That, I did not want to do that. I, I just love the palm trees. And I called the garden rebel. And I said, Vince, I want you to come over here, the guy that knows everything. And I said, I want you to, I want you to help us with our flower beds and things. And he did. And he said, preacher, are you going to remove this stuff? And I said, yeah, we'll remove it. He said, Okay. I got a bobcat, a tractor, a piece of equipment. And I went out there and I cut the palm trees off. 
And I took the chains and wrapped it around the base of that palm tree. We dug around that palm tree and got that bobcat and went like pulling teeth. Yeah. I went and got my wisdom teeth extracted. After an hour and a half, Dr. Lim said, I'm going to go take a break. He said, my hands are or cramping, I'm having such a hard time. He could not get one of my wisdom teeth out. It was a wonderful experience. <laughs> and I'm just saying that we like to never got those. In fact, we did not get those palm trees out. We ended up digging down about six or seven feet and cutting the tap roots off of them to get them out. Why? Because those roots went deep. That helps them with their durability. Jesus said, I'm the vine. I'm your root system. But I wanted to say something in closing, and that is cold will kill a palm tree. A lot of things won't kill them, but the coal will. We're not designed to be cold. We're not even designed to be lukewarm. Father, I pray that you'd help us this morning to understand some truths about palm tree people. Help us, Lord, to give praise unto you for who you are and for what you do. Lord, I ask you that you'd work in our hearts and lives, and I pray that you'd bring forth fruit for your glory. Bless the service to follow, I ask in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Fellowship one with another, and we'll get ready for our morning service.